You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly Bulletproof Radio. A state of high performance. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today's episode is live in person, my very favorite kind at my studios in Austin where I just moved. And it turns out there's all kinds of cool people in Austin. Funny, that's one of the reasons I moved here. And one of the many cool friends here in town is Dr. Molly Malouf. If you're a longtime listener, at least since episode 706, you already know who Molly is. Uh, She's well known for her work in mitochondria and women's biohacking, which is what we're gonna talk about today, specifically biohacking for women. She's also pretty well known for psychedelic work as well. And we've sat down several times at my conferences, by the way guys, biohackingconference.com. You go there in June in Orlando. Molly, you gonna be there? Oh, of course. Hopefully I'm gonna be speaking. (laughs) Well, you spoke last year. I mean, you have to really step it up. Oh, you mean biohacking for women? Maybe we could do that. Yeah. So, why did you write a book on biohacking for women? I just feel like I figured out so much in this one life. Like when I was a kid, I remember hitting puberty and I distinctly remember being like, someday I'm gonna understand my body. I'm gonna understand what's going on right now. I'm gonna understand how this thing works because I'm so confused. And I think a lot of women really fly blind through life just wondering what is going on inside my body? What is happening to me? And we go through so much change. We go through puberty. We go through you know our fertility years. We go through perimenopause, we go through menopause, we go through postmenopause, and our lives are constantly changing. And then throughout the month, we're going through our menstrual cycle, and a lot of women are so confused about that. Um, and I just kind of wanted to take all the learnings that I've made in my practice and in my own life and in my own health and put it into a book. And someone recently said, Molly, you've written the biohacking Bible, <laughs> which was really cool. Nice. Yeah. It- it's so true that there are foundational things like mitochondria are important for men and women. Yeah. And you talk about mitochondria in here. Yeah. Uh, I've said since the beginning of biohacking, and by the way, you guys wouldn't know this, but about 55% of biohackers are women. And it's been that way wow. since I started. Huh. People go, it's such a male thing. I'm like, I don't know if you guys look at the numbers, but no, biohacking has always been for men yeah. and women. Yeah. But women are much better biohackers on average than men because men are like, yeah, we went through puberty. And then we went through some kind of andropause mm-hmm. thing that we don't really notice because it takes 10 years and we would just get like fat and hunched and cranky. Yeah. But it was so slow we didn't notice. Uh, and then that's that. Yep. And so we don't have to deal with the change that you'll see on a monthly basis. Like my, your performance was massively different on this day oh, to this day. Oh, for sure. And you weren't hungover. Yeah. So guys are, we just don't have to train for that, but yeah. women usually do. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes you more perceptive of where your body is. Well, I, I, I it wasn't until I think at the last maybe three or four years that I even I really started truly tracking my period consistently and doing it in a way that was like, how do I build a lifestyle around my menstrual cycle? Like, I, I, I didn't really fully accept that like I was not a man like five years ago. Like I was like, oh, oh. I can do, I literally dated a guy, I dated a guy that was like, he's like, you can do anything that I can do. And I was like, dude, I'm fasting just as much as you are and, and I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm starting to really notice that this is not working for me the way it was before. And it was working for a few months and then yeah. I was doing it every other, I was doing it every other day it, fast. It happens every time. Like yeah. women over fast, they over keto. Yep. Guys do too. It just takes us twice as long as you to hit the wall. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I've met bodybuilders that are men that have definitely messed up their hormones by doing too much cutting. And obviously it can happen to guys, but I think women's bodies, because of our biological imperatives are a little bit different. Like. We, we are des- I mean, women are oxytocin dominant. We're designed to help create life and to nurture life. Men are really vasopressin dominant, designed to protect life and to protect against aggressors, to actually defend the, the tribe, you know? Uh, yeah, there is such a thing as masculine, such a thing as feminine. The energies are different. And yes, women can exhibit masculine, like you just sure. talked about. A lot of women entrepreneurs are exhausted from putting out too much masculine energy. Yeah. And especially if you watch any like modern movie, it's mm-hmm. like the way women display power is by martial arts. I'm like yeah. that's not feminine power. The yeah. way I know feminine power. Yeah. And guys, same thing. We can express femininity as well. And and so there's a whole conversation there that may go down to mitochondria. But before that, sure. Your book is called The Spark Factor. And I was really honored that you asked me to write the foreword for it. Yeah. So thank you. And the well, first thank guide, you so much. You're welcome. First guide for biohacking for women. And I, I declined your invitation to read the intro because I couldn't do it in the You're time. really, it was a really busy time in the year. Like the end of the year was That's crazy right. for me. I mean, it's funny because this is one of those years that I, I finally reached like, I think 
I feel I, I realized like I finally hit the wall of like performance and stress. Like where I was like, okay, I finally hit the amount of stress that I can handle before my performance really declines. And um, you know, I had the great thing about this book is like even just rereading it myself. Like I realized there, are, I'm gonna even be returning to this book regularly because our bodies are constantly changing, our demands are constantly changing, and our stress levels are constantly changing. And last year was a really stressful year for a lot of people. It was a, a year of a tremendous change. And um, and what I really want to teach people is that biohacking is about consistently checking in, getting your measurements taken, actually taking a scientific approach to your body, not just flying blind and just doing things and taking supplements because you think that they're good for you, but because you have data to, to, to drive those decisions. It's funny, I'm going to be on Jillian Michaels' podcast soon, and I'm oh a little gosh. nervous because she's very much mm -hmm. about calories in, calories out. Why are you nervous? You, you, have, <laughs> you have science? What do I say? To, I mean, I've always been like, I've always been like, mm, calories in, calories out, actually, the the rules don't apply to it. We're not a closed system, you know? It doesn't work that way. I think people need new options for health because things that aren't working just aren't. And you know, Christopher Palmer, this mm -hmm. new doctor, he just from Harvard, he just started putting up social media. He just published a book um, called Brain Energy. And I'm like- I just interviewed him a oh couple my weeks gosh, ago. I introduced him to Dr. Amen. He's great. The reason why oh, I love his stuff is because I think we're starting to realize there's a common theory of health and it's all about metabolism. So like if your energy flow of your body is not functioning normally, your brain isn't gonna norm function normally because your brain is very energy, it, it, it demands a lot of energy and so does your heart. And this is why I wrote about COVID in the book and COVID's a very controversial topic to write about. So how much of the spark factor is about like COVID? It's really a small portion, but okay. it, what it's really about is like trying to teach people that if you understand mitochondrial health, you'll understand a lot of different conditions. You'll yeah. understand mental illness, you'll understand all the, all the major chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and dementia. Like these are what kills us, right? And you'll actually understand immune system dysregulation, immune system dysfunction, which sets you up for infection. So it's like, I wanted to create a book that was like a common theory of health. Like what is this sort of common thread? Because I feel like the medical system has created this ontology of, of disease that is based on pathophysiology, right? We're taught about all these different ways that people get sick. Mm -hmm. But I was in the hospital watching over and over and over again that all these people that I was treating had the same risk factors, right? They weren't eating properly, they weren't exercising properly, they were stressed out beyond comprehension, they had a lot of trauma, and they lived in environments that were poisoning them. And it's like, why? Like, why do those things lead to all these different manifestations of disease? And it's the, it's through the mitochondrial dysfunction, right? And And this is what, the book tries to teach people is like, okay, if you want to biohack your body, you got to understand how the body works. And it's, it's, it's not simple, but it's certainly not nearly as complicated as what I was taught in medical school. You know what? I love getting to just sit down and chat with you, whether we're on camera or not, because you, you get it. Yeah. And not, there are some doctors who, who really see this, but most of the time in medicine, you fall into this, you know, if I have a hammer, everything's a nail. Mm -hmm. And so someone is, okay, it's all about even, it's all about mold. Well, no, mold's a common trigger of the actual sure. problem, but it's not the only one. Yeah. And so the person thinks it's all about mold, well, didn't like see EBV. Yeah. You know, obesity is a great example. Someone, one of my friends was saying yesterday, she's like, well, you, didn't you see that obesity is, is a disease? And I was like, a disease is literally a term for a condition that we have now labeled as something we can treat medically. Yeah. Right? Was semaglutide anyone? Exactly, right? <laughs> Which, by the way, is a really cool drug. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that like, Elon and the Kardashians have all gotten super lean on it, which is pretty interesting. And then I just found out yesterday, I was reading on Instagram, that Khloe Kardashian is like, I have not lost weight on Ozempic. And it's like, lady, you're tiny. Like, clearly you're doing something and it's not just lifting weights, okay? Like... <laughs> and also, it probably wasn't Ozempic. It was probably the new one that Wagobi doesn't... Yeah, or whatever. The, yeah. The tr tr Look, I'm grateful that we have these tools. And how does this awesome. thing work? This thing improves insulin sensitivity and glucagon balance. It makes mitochondria work better, you mean? Who oh, knew? Like, it maybe Maybe it's anti-aging. Oh, it is. I mean, this is the cool thing, uh, peptides. Like, the cool thing that I'm seeing in the world is that peptides are becoming medicine. This is a no, big deal. terrible. Peptides were... They're just going to get 10 times more expensive and be illegal in the U.S. Well, so we have to go to Thailand to buy well, them. So, like, here's an interesting peptide, bromelatide, br br I can't pronounce it, PT-141. Yeah, I love that stuff. If I inject it a lot. If you get this from a doctor that's a prescription version, it's like, you know, thousands of dollars and it's yeah. an injection, but you can get it from a compounding pharmacy right. for like a fraction of the cost. Like 200 like bucks. 150 bucks. Ideally, we want to get medicines that are properly dosed, mm -hmm. properly produced, properly regulated in a way that we know are safe. Like what a lot of people don't realize is that most doctors that are working within the insurance system yeah. are basically given a formulary 
And that formulary says what they can and cannot prescribe. And that is that is actually designed by the insurance company. So mm -hmm. doctors are subcontractors of insurance companies now. And I get messages from doctors all over the country regularly who say, Molly, like things are falling apart. Yeah. Like things they, are, and, and they I hate, hate their life. I, and it's not just that, like the actual system is breaking down. And I knew this was gonna happen when I was in medical school because I was lobbying for healthcare reform and I was like, uh oh, this whole Medicare reimbursement rate situation is not changing any year. We I come back every year and they're not doing anything about this situation. And then I was like, well, we're gonna just end up seeing a dual system emerge. We're gonna have a public option that's gonna look like Medicare and the VA, and then we're gonna have a private option, and that's essentially what's emerged. But what I didn't anticipate happening was the digital option, right? Like I about 10 years ago when I started working in tech, and we were both in the Bay Area. I was like starting to work with startups and I've worked with over 50 companies in 10 years. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I kind of got a reputation as an innovator. But um, I did it because I needed to fund building a practice from scratch <laughs> and I didn't know how. So I was like, maybe I'll go talk to startups and teach them about how the healthcare system works. Yeah. Cause I've been working in healthcare since I was in ninth grade. And, uh, and so I started working with all these companies and I was like, oh my God, like there's gonna be a tsunami of innovation happening from technology companies that's going to just engulf medicine. and. It's basically, we're seeing all these companies basically go to direct to consumer. They're building these physician networks. They're, they're doing all these online prescription pr products and experiences. It's not always good. I mean, obviously like that one company that did Adder Adderall prescriptions is kind of in trouble with the government. Who knew that <laughs> selling, you know, I actually talked to one of these investors who is investing in the company. I'm like, you do realize that this is just a, this is just like a drug deal, right? You know, you could just in invest in a pirate's den anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but it's funny because like, I think we're entering a phase of, of really people are looking for truth. And the truth is coming out. I mean, the Twitter files, I mean, all of this stuff is coming out. Can, can I say something really bad? Sure. Adderall actually works. <laughs> it's an amphetamine. It, it's a horrible drug, but it works. It and totally if works if, to increase stress hormones. If you're going to crash the helicopter you're flying, you should take some Adderall because then you'll stay awake and hmm. no one will die, except you'll want to kill people more so you might shoot them, which is why they switched to modafinil for the government, which works better than Adderall, and I took it every day for eight years. Wow. In fact, I'm on it today right now. Interesting. So, like, it's okay to use pharmaceutical enhancement as long as the benefit's greater than the cost. Totally. And you really were the, one of the first people to start talking about nootropics openly. Oh, yeah. Like, you were the first. Like, everybody was like, what is... I took a lot of hits for that. Like that's unethical. I'm like, yeah, I, I, you know, what do they call the guy at the bottom of the class at Wharton who gets his MBA? I don't M know. MBA. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, I use smart drugs to get to the bottom of my class. I win. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. When I was in medical school, I was like, getting, I was basically somewhere in the middle of my class, yeah. and I was really bad. I had really bad test anxiety, and I went to a psychologist, and I was like, all right, I'm miserable. I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, look. You're not depressed, you're not anxious, you don't have any diseases. You're just a stressed out medical student who's not, keep, not taking care of herself. So I was like, oh wait, so this is my responsibility. And he gave me the biggest favor he could have ever given me. Instead of giving me antidepressants, he was like, hey, you need to take care of your body. And I wasn't, wow. I wasn't doing was that. This? I mean, this was medical school, right? Like 10 I was, years ago or something? This was tw uh, probably like, I don't know, I graduated in 2011, I think. Okay, so, so yeah, 10, 12 years yeah. ago. That's, that's really progressive. That's yeah. so impressive. But what I did from there was I said, okay, I'm a scientist. I'm going to go into the science. What do I need to do to change my health? So I started doing yoga. I stopped drinking. I was coming drinking mugs of espresso. It was not normal. Yeah, you're supposed to do mugs Maybe of Maybe just like a little espresso. It wasn't like a mug. And I was doing all-nighters. I wasn't exercising. I was super sedentary. I was super isolated. I was doing everything wrong with my health because I was trying to study and get the grade. Yeah. And I was not performing. I was not performing at my best. So I, I changed my lifestyle. I started doing yoga. I stopped doing all-nighters. I stopped drinking so much coffee. I stopped eating, you know, raisin bran for food for meals, which Jeez. is, you know, I started eating real food. I started spending more time with my family, my friends, and my grades started to go up. My performance started to improve. My mood started to improve. I had more capacity. I had more, I had better performance. I had more productivity and all my, and I, I went from an average on my first board exam to a 99th percentile on my second. Dang. And nobody does that in medical school. And all my peers were like, did you cheat? And I was like, no, I didn't cheat. I just changed my lifestyle. That's cheating. And they were like, well, what did you do? And I was like, look, I'm not just gonna tell you what I did, I'm gonna teach you. And so I recruited like 10 doctors. And I was like, hey, will you help me teach health, 
health to my peers, because this is not part of the curriculum. And in medical school, I was at the largest medical school in the country, and there was not wellness in the curriculum. They weren't teaching sleep, they weren't teaching fitness, they weren't teaching nutrition, they weren't teaching integrated medicine, they weren't teaching mind-body health, they weren't teaching relationships, and all this stuff was fundamental to health. And I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna create a course. And so I got it added to the curriculum, and I ended up winning a bunch of awards for this. That's so but cool. It was like this first, it was like, I was like, how is this not part of our education? You know, like I, a medical student shouldn't be the one bringing this to the to the curriculum. You know, this should, should be baked in. But our curriculums are largely designed by pharmaceutical um, incentives. So almost everything we are taught is how to diagnose disease and what to treat it with. And what do you treat it with? You treat it with drugs and surgery. And don't get me wrong, I've had surgery and I've taken drugs and they've certainly helped in certain cases. They're awesome. They're, like they're, I take a little bit of thyroid medicine, a very small amount, and it, it's, it's great. I take a relatively large amount. It's there even you go. better. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it's like, there's, there's nothing wrong with using medical technology no. for biohacking. And I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people, and I feel like more women than men, they're purists. Like, I would never use a drug. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like, We're you should use a drug. Drugs. Yeah, Some they, of these drugs are some... life changing, yeah. you know? But we shouldn't depend on them completely, and we shouldn't be replacing, using them instead of lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's one of the things I've been trying to like hammer into my, my family members. I'm like, yes, you can take these medicines, but we really got to do all these other things too. You know, yeah. have you seen this woman train with Joan on Instagram? I haven't. She's like, get out of me in her seventies. And she went from like typical overweight, middle-aged woman to being fit as fuck. Like she is strong. She mm -hmm. is a bodybuilder and she, her body is incredible. And I'm like, I think now we are real, people are realizing like we don't need to age the way our parents did and our grandparents did. We can get stronger as we get older. Yes. Well, th there is this argument about, I'm really kind of like blown away by just how much of a controversy fasting is. Like I took out yeah. about four different sections of like, I, when it comes to fasting, I have a whole program of how you, how you start with you know yeah. ketosis, whole foods, ketosis, cutting, up, cutting back on snacking, intermittent fasting, and then going into longer fasts. And I cut out all the prolonged fasting stuff because I was getting shamed by people who were like, you are going to be ripped to shreds for recommending this to women. Wow. And I was like, I, and it was really just this realization that there's there's this, even Walter Longo, who was supposed to be the father of fasting, is now cutting back on his fa statements he, on fasting. He's funny because I, I asked him about that. Yeah. Have you had him on your show? Mm -mm. So I asked him about that a while ago and he's like, well, that's what the mice did. So that's what I'm gonna do. And the bottom line is fasting for a long period of time every day isn't it doesn't make a lot of sense yeah but you can look at people like mindy pals you know mm -hmm. fast like a girl and there's room for looking at fasting as a tool but just like doing adderall every single day is probably really bad for you um so is fasting every single day we also need to think about are you insulin sensitive or not are yeah. sensitive or not do you have insulin resistance do you have metabolic dysfunction do you have prediabetes or diabetes do you have polycystic ovarian disorder or are you underweight undernourished are you like, did your period stop because you have red S, like relative energy deficiency of sport? Like there's a, there's, fasting is like a tool in the toolbox that you need to use for your life. And it, you may not need it. If you're, you're young, fit, healthy, fertile, you may not need to do a lot of fasting. Mm -hmm. But as you're hitting menopause and you're noticing your metabolism is shifting, I find women that are going through perimenopause doing some of these short-term fasts are really helpful for maintaining changes, their weight. It changes their whole life and their energy comes back and it's magic. And if those women went vegan, they'd feel great for a month and then hit the wall. And oh, I did like, veganism for a month and I definitely hit the wall and it yeah. was like, did not work for me. But I, I do think that there is something to be said about different body types, right? And like, I think I'm a more of a mesomorph and I definitely lean a little bit more, um, a little bit more paleo primal than anything. I'm not yeah. really into grains. I don't, I do some beans occasionally, but not a lot. Um, but we're, I think we're entering a phase of, deep personalization of nutrition. We have more tools than we've ever had before. And this sort of dietary dogma stuff, to me, I'm just like, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of sick of hearing about carnivores. I'm sorry. Like, uh, I love I'm, meat, I eat it, but I love vegetables. I actually think that the carnivore diet and the vegan diet do very similar things over time. And I- They eliminate a lot of processed I, foods, unless you're a vegan who right. eats processed foods. <laughs> I, I did about three months of carnivore when I was testing the edges of the Bulletproof diet, like back in 20, 12 yeah. or something yeah. and I gave myself leaky gut and oh, wow. gave myself an egg allergy wow. and I felt amazing and I was like doing 4,000 calories a day too and wow. not exercising I was trying to gain weight and just to show this diet was superior and it's so thermogenic and, and I just I felt so good and I ended up doing it for that whole time and at the end of it I was waking up sometimes 40 times a night without knowing it on my sleep monitoring it was I used a Zio back then oh wow and 
I'm like, oh, that's funny. It was great in the short term and it breaks from the long term. Yeah. And that's why I'm like, guys, you need to have some less inflammatory plants and have some yeah. carbs in the cycle. And like, yeah. that's where carnivores, like, oh, I do carnivore, except I eat fruit and honey and dairy products. I'm like, that's I not... love non-starchy vegetables. Yeah, but... I love making veggie purees and soups. Yeah, I do too. And like, that, that's not... That's not carnivore if you're eating fruit. I'm sorry. Like, that's another thing. In fact, yeah. it, it looks a lot like the original recommendations I had, which was <laughs> cycle, eat grass fed yeah. meat, cycle, uh, yeah. have some carbs, don't have some carbs. And so you don't have to have a name. And some people need more carbs than others. Yeah. I think there is an argument that says if you eat uh, grains mm -hmm. and you eat legumes, that you will be mineral deficient almost by definition because of phytic acid. That's there why danger coffee has all the minerals yeah. and all. And my but, coffee is great, by the way. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I, I go back that. and forth on and off of coffee because my cortisol levels, but yeah. when I'm on it, like, oh my God, it's just like jet fuel. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> We're on it right now. So. I know. I'm like <laughs> loving this because like, I, 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 I measure my cortisol in like, I think it was after Burning Man and I remember saying, oh, oh yeah. shoot, my, my cortisol is way too high. So I had to cut back on the coffee, but I definitely go in and out of like mud water versus coffee and, and your coffee is awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, the point though about minerals is, yeah. is like that, that matters. And I like it in your book that you're not like, you have to be carnivore. I don't think carnivore works well long-term for women, but short-term it can change your life by shifting your gut. And same thing, like on the vegan thing. Yeah. Uh, but when I you... I do know some people who go vegan as they get older and yeah. they've, they've lost weight and they feel healthier. But um, the thing about veganism is that I feel like people wrinkle faster because they're not getting enough, yeah. they're not getting enough fats. You don't get fat and you don't get collagen and their bone density oh, goes Oh yeah, the bone density is a big problem. And sarcopenia happens. They, they lose muscle. That's, the, that, that's one yeah. of the things when I was trying to write the section on protein, I was getting a lot of pushback from my editors because they were like, everyone in the longevity space is saying, like Sinclair and Longo, they're all like, protein, 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 too much protein is mTOR, mTOR, mTOR. And it's like- Carbs raise mTOR more than protein. Boom. And the thing is, is, is that like, Muscle mass is, your muscles are filled with mitochondria. They're red for a reason. And so we need muscle to maintain our health mm -hmm. long term. And having had two grandparents get completely frail and immobilized through, um, one was a fall after a surgery and the other was due to rheumatoid arthritis, knowing yeah. what frailty does to health and seeing it deteriorate my grandparents, like, I don't want that to ever be me. And I want to stay strong and healthy. And I know that muscle mass is, way, is the way to do that. It, it's funny because there is overwhelming evidence that too much protein containing methionine and tryptophan sure. does raise mTOR chronically. And there's an amazing solution for that. It's called intermittent fasting. And exercise. Right? <laughs> so so it's just not a you problem. And, yeah. and in my anti-aging book, I went through all this stuff. And on average, if you do 0 0.6 grams of carbs per pound of body weight, um, you'll actually, that, that appears to be optimal. But that doesn't mean that on one day you don't have 1.5 grams yeah. and the next day you eat nothing yeah. and it works out to 0 0.6. And that's where I think a lot of people get confused. So. It's funny because everybody has such strong, strong opinions. And I'm always asking myself like, where is this, where is the truth amongst all the arguments? Like, and I, I really tried to sit with all of these arguments and be like, where's the science behind all this? Where is the science? And that's I know, I mean, I know for a fact that if you live in Guatemala and you're hiking up those mountains every day, you can justify that corn corn intake that you're consuming. As long as you... I've seen those people... As long as you process the corn traditionally they to do remove that. phytic acid. They do that. But we don't. We don't, oh, right. you know? And so I ate some, I ate some corn in, um, in, uh, in Puerto Rico recently, and boy, did my body... And rice. Did you shred your My gut? body just like... Just swole, just got so swollen. I can't handle corn. It's crazy how fast you can just go from like lean to like swollen and like just eating the it's wrong like a grains. Food baby. It's a food right? baby. Yeah. yeah. But the cool thing about biohacking is that like I literally I've, I've, I've ta I take photos of my body more than I weigh myself just to see my body change. Really? Yeah. It's amazing how biohacking can teach you. Like you can get into shape in like a couple months. It's like, not hard. Like a month of just like eating like lower carb and exercising more and boom. Lower carb, higher protein, and yeah. the right kinds of fat, and it's and like boom. You there just you go. get lean. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. I, I hit 7.1% body fat accidentally last month. Uh-oh. Yeah, was, like, was pretty lean, man. I, 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 no, I was like, I need to eat more I'm carbs. I'm pretty sure there, there, some of the evidence suggests that we do need a little bit more no, body fat I, that's not that. healthy. I, yeah. I, I think 10 is a good number. Yeah. So I, I'm up to like 8.5. But I've been like adding fruit in the morning, which is like the worst recommendation ever. I, I'm <laughs> like, that makes you hungry all day. But my metabolism is working so well that like yeah. I'm just trying to pack on a little bit more fat. And how fun is that to get to eat fruit? No, right? You know? Uh, and I, I have like a lot of extra skin, especially on like my low back sure. and my butt. Yeah. Uh, 
and how do you, I, I'm gonna do some radio frequency thing that heats the tissues, but oh, cool. as a doctor, like how do you get rid of like, I mean, you have all these women who've read this, they read the spark factor, they're gonna lose all I the sweat. I mean, I have to say that for all this stuff like that, like Amy Killen, she's the, she, she she's is. good, she's been on the show she a few is, times. She's so smart, like, yeah. I go to her for a lot of questions, but she also just seems to always be on the cutting edge of regenerative medicine. Yeah, she is, yeah, she's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I would say for at least, I don't know, when, when it comes to skin, I, I, I really look at like, I don't know, what do I do for my skin? That's, I mean, I, I'm constantly, the main thing I do is I exfoliate and I moisturize. So, like, and, you're, and, 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 and you're still relatively young yeah. or you just have anti-aging genes, so then. Well, my, it's funny, I, I don't wanna say this, on, I don't think my sisters are listening, but like, <laughs> I do think I look younger than all of my sisters and most of them are younger than me. Okay. And it's because I don't drink a lot, yeah. I, I wear sunscreen yeah. and I don't eat a lot of carbs. Oh, okay, hold on. You know? You're into mitochondria and you wear sunscreen, explain. Um, personally, like I, I do think that like, I love Young Goose, their products. They That's have, so good. I like their stuff too. They have great stuff. Yeah. They have a very, very non-toxic sunscreen. Like a mineral based one. And it just prevents wrinkles. And like, yeah. it, 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 to me, like, it's one of the secrets to- And you just to, put it on your face. Just my face. Yeah. Okay. Ch face and back. And, and yeah. I, I want to oh, be- Oh, not on my body. No, okay. no, no, never. I, I want to be the really The secret clear. to the body is yeah. omega-3s. Yeah. yeah. I do mega doses of omega-3s. Really? You don't yeah. think that's dangerous? Mm. Okay. No. How much is a mega dose? I take like four grams. That's pretty heavy for your yeah. body weight. Yeah. Yeah. But it's made a huge difference in my labs. My labs yeah. look completely different. Some people just won't do it. But if you want good omegas, you got to go to the source. And they're made in this. They're made in factories that are that pharmaceuticals are made. You know. Yeah. You got to get pharmaceutical grade omegas. That's what I used at Bulletproof. We had pharmaceutical grade herring oil yeah. in our in our yeah. supplements. Because, and you got to break them. You got to break it oil. open. You yeah. got to taste it. Yeah. And you got to know the difference between rancid and non rancid. Rancid is going to taste like fish guts dead yep. and non-rancid will just taste lightly fishy. Right. And I've actually like, I I, I actually I was producing a, a su supplement brand in 2020 that was a basically a COVID treatment and mm -hmm. it had omegas in it and I opened up our, our omega and I was like, crap, I can't sell these. Yeah. They're totally rancid. And the company that I was, that was producing them was like, well, these are the ones we use. And I was like, well, I can't sell these anymore. So, you know, the problem is the problem with omegas is that most of them are rancid. Yep. Vast majority of them are rancid. So you You're really right. got to do your homework. I, I add uh, rosemary extract and hydroxytyrosol, yeah. which yeah. is the stuff that keeps olive oil pure yep. uh, when I'm formulating those. Yeah. And that makes a big difference because yep. you can stabilize them. And I would also, and this is going to sound really bad, and food babe, I'm sorry, Vani. Um, <laughs> I would support adding BHT to fish oil. Oh, is she anti-BHD? Oh my God, she's like rabid about it. Why? Uh, because BHD at very high doses in rats in a study in the 70s was an endocrine disruptor. Interesting. And like Vani and I are friends. And like, yeah. I, you know, like, yeah. like, like we support each other's work. Yeah. And I, I love it that she takes on big food. So, yeah. so um, but uh, BHT, I've recommended it to dozens of friends who have cold sores and herpes or chicken pox. Oh or yeah, shingles, you told me about And this. it fixes it like in three days. That's crazy. Any pox virus goes away with this like 10 cent antioxidant that people took in large doses. What about HHV6? Uh, I don't know if that's a lipid encapsulated you, you virus. virus it, oh, if it's an H, if it's an uh, anyone in the herpes family, it'll do that. And here's the thing. Wow. People took BHT to prevent oil oxidation in their cells in large doses for wow. 20 years, starting wow. in the 70s through the 90s. Wow. So it's not particularly harmful, but at high enough doses, it does disrupt endocrine system sure. stuff. But having a little bit of that in your food is probably the least of your issues compared to artificial colors and flavors and artificial sweeteners yeah. and heavy metals and all this other yeah. stuff. So I'm like, this is a medically useful thing that shouldn't be demonized when- It should be studied. The risk of a herpes virus and side effects or any pox virus, including monkeypox. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I did look that up when you told me this last time we spoke yeah. and I didn't find, there's not a lot of literature Steve on it. Steve Folks is the guy who wrote the yeah. whole book with all the studies in it, oh. F-O-W-K-S. He was one of yeah. our mentors in the early days. Amazing of learning anti-aging gotcha. to become a biohacker. Cool. And the book is called like Cure Your Herpes or something with BHT. And oh it's, it's a free download, yeah. Amazing. So I'll, I'll find a copy. You can talk to Steve if you want, I'll hook you up. Cool, I'd love that. Yeah, you'd like that. Yeah, Okay. awesome. Um, so anyway, we got to BHT in, in the context of not oxidizing oil. So if you added a little BHT yeah. to fish oil, it would be stabilized. That's amazing. But you're right, you need it. And it's funny, I see people who take too much fish oil and too much is probably highly variable. Uh, and this I think the inflammation is from the rancidity. It 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 could be. Yeah. Um, you know. I think a lot of these studies. I mean, there's also Lavasa people get prescriptions for, which is like technically pharmaceutical grade omegas. But it's it, all the hard thing about supplements is is that 
there's so many different factories around the world producing different, producing different quality and then they put it under one brand. And so you don't actually know and so unless these things get tested, you know? Yeah, the supplements that I formulate are a little bit more expensive because I do the exactly. testing and I insist on you know, this manufacturer yeah. and people wouldn't know. You know what gets, gets me is like the vitamin D controversy. There are, there are doctors, there's literally, I, I used to be friends with this, I used to actually be on the Tufts Nutrition Council. And oh, wow. Darius Mozafarian is like, I really admired this guy. And I really like looked up to him as a, as a hero. And I realized that like, he's like, he's super against vitamin D supplementation. And I'm like- Does he just hate humans? I just don't understand how people don't take vitamin D. Like, it's so game changing. It's one of the first things I read in one of your first books that you pub published. And I test everyone for this. I think it's vital if you want to avoid infection. And <laughs> the data is pretty bone clear on density. that. <laughs> There's so much data, and yet the, 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 like in the mainstream medical community, it's still controversial. It's still something that people are, are like, I don't know if we, I don't know if people needed this. And I'm like, oh my god, literally, how, how? Let's face it. Most doctors are still telling you to eat less cholesterol, even though the American Heart Association has labeled dietary cholesterol as a nutrient of non-concern. They're like, guys, we were wrong. You can yeah. eat all the cholesterol you want. It doesn't yeah. affect you. Yeah. And so just medicine doesn't follow it. And, and that's why I love it that you wrote a guide for women to biohack, the sure. Spark Factor yeah. guys. Um, and it's why... Uh, it's part of what made biohacking into a thing. Yeah. And it's why my new book that comes out, like us, yours is on the market now, right? What, what was your January 31st. January 31st. Okay, cool. So it's coming out. And mine's a, oh, a month after yours. Awesome. Smarter, not harder. And same thing in there. Ooh, smarter, not harder. Yeah. Love this. And, and it, it's got more biohacks in it. But the idea, same thing. You talk about vitamin D. But then there's the cofactors that go with it. Yeah. There's, I call it vitamin D1, DAKE, D-A-K-E. Yeah. Right? If you get those fat solubles and you get your minerals, then yeah. all of the biohacks and the spark factor, all the biohacks, yeah. any meditation, lifting weights, walking, all of it works better. And I feel like D without K might actually be dangerous though. Oh, I do D with K1 and K2. Okay. Yeah, you have to for cardiovascular health. Yep. Um, but one of the things that's in the book that I think is unique is, you know, the biohacking relationships. Right. So like we have just all went through a massive social experiment of isolation. And I don't know if you noticed, but diseases of despair, like alcoholism, drug addiction, suicides, and even homicides, which a lot of people are kill people because of despair. Yeah, that, that's right on track with these the are all going up, right? And and like they're really problematic for society. And I don't think we realized just how bad isolating people was until after the fact. But I can't tell you the number of people I talk to who, when you ask them about their social lives, they're like, what social life? You know, like one in 10 men, or sorry, one in 10 women and one in five men don't have any friends. This is dangerous to health because that sends signals to your nervous system that you're not safe. If you don't have a tribe of people around you, if you don't have friends around you, if you don't have social interaction, your brain is set on unsafety. Think about China right now. I mean, China is doing this massive social experiment of social control and people are starting to revolt, right? Like yeah. it goes against the fundamental programming of our genes, you, you the cannot, fundamental programming of our yeah. bodies. You, you can't suppress people for very long because with even if our brains aren't in there, our, our meat will rebel against that. It's the mitochondria, right? Yeah, like <laughs> they literally are, they're social organelles, which when, yep. I, when I was reading uh, Martine Picard's work on social mm -hmm. organelles, I was like, Wait, so you're telling me that life, like the patterns of life are conserved on multiple levels? Who knew? You, you know you about know? the F words in, in my books, right? Yeah. yeah. And if you're just tuning into the show, um, all life in order does fear, food, the other F word, we'll call it fertility, <laughs> uh, and then friend in order. So yeah. if, if you try to take away friends from people, we are not nourished. If you take away sex and love from people, we're not nourished. Yeah. Take away food, we're not nourished. Yeah. You could take away fear and we'd be happier, but then we'd put all of our energy into the bottom ones. So yeah. if, if all of our energy is on fear, you can starve people of food. You yeah. can starve people of love and you can starve Sex. people until they explode. And when they explode, they do not go quietly. Mm -hmm. And like, you think governments would figure this out because those people also have mitochondria unless they're robots. Yeah. Do you yeah. think they're robots? I mean, I definitely have met some robots in my <laughs> life and they're kind of scary. I know but that. I mean, the thing is, is like, I didn't really fully understand how, I mean, I really want to understand love. Like for the last two years I've been studying love and like how do you- What did you learn? Oh my God. I mean, I thought love was this Disney movie beauty. Like I was like, oh, Beauty and the Beast. Like all these stories were told as kids about love being this beautiful, you know, these like songs we hear on fucking Spotify. Mm -hmm. 
And then I really started studying love from a scientific perspective and I was like, oh wow, love is not this beautiful story. It's actually really challenging. Like it, mm -hmm. when you have high quality, healthy social relationships and social connection and, and healthy families and, and partners, it will transform your health. It will literally transform the quality of your existence. And it's the greatest factor we know in long-term health and happiness. But, if, but, the, but the flip side of love is that there's things like stalking. There's things like harassment. There's things like domestic abuse. There's things like, I mean, you, you hear these stories of women who are abused in their, in their homes and okay. men, and they come back to their partners because they're attached. Right? We have this thing called human attachment, right? Stephen Porges talks about that. Stephen is amazing. Yeah. He's actually, so Stephen Porges and Sue Carter became mentors of mine in the last couple years. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so Sue is on my advisory so board. Okay. And I literally, like, Sue has taught me so much about love. Like, her and Helen Fisher are like my mentors. So grateful for them because they basically schooled me. They were like, Molly, we love that you have this company around the science of love. Here, we're going to tell you what it's really about. And so, Basically, like a lot of um, a lot of what love boils down to is essentially we have three different drives, right? We have the sex drive, we have the romantic love drive, and we have the pair bonding drive. And the pair bonding drive extends to familial bonds, right, and social bonds because. Mm -hmm. When we feel safe with our friends and our family, we get oxytocin. Yeah. We feel connected. But when someone threatens our friends and family, we go vasopressin dominant. We go attack. We defend. We take care of our people that we love. So there is this flip side of love where love is not just about feeling warm and fuzzy. Love is also about protection and defense, right? Love is part of the reason why, you know, people do attack people that they that, that you know, for example, if people are getting divorced or people are going through breakups. Like when you lose love, it sets off alarm signals in the brain. It really does. Big ones. And, and it's because when you lose love, it's targeting the, your survival, right? right? So love is so deeply tied to our survival because we evolved our social connections and our love specifically to propagate the species. So like there's this woman, Emily Nagoski, and she wrote a great book called Come As You Are. Right, yeah, And great she's book. an absolute bre it's badass. It's like a sex book though. It's a great book on sex. Yeah. But the one thing she gets wrong is she says we don't have a sex drive. She says we don't have a sex drive. I, I would just raise my hand and say yes, we do. One hundred percent, we do. The sex drive is what drives so much of our decisions in life. Oh yeah, it's running Third the fucking show in the background. Uh -huh. And I, I think I'm a lot more after having dealt with like a, a like dealing with a someone who has a cluster B personality disorder, and thinking that I could help a person who has trauma. And realizing that some people cannot be helped. And only if they're open to help can they be helped. Only if they're open to help. Like realizing what happens when you break, when you kind of like break off communication with someone who's got trauma and personality disorders. They can become stalkers. It's really, it, they, I have a stalker. Um, I'm sorry. It's really hard. And it's also, but there's a great TED talk called uh, about unhealthy love, healthy and unhealthy love. And young women are particularly at risk for unhealthy love because men are more likely to you know, men are designed to go after what they want, right? They're, 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 not, they're not, not all men are stalkers by any means. Not all men are aggressors. But men have programming for, for essentially, they're stronger. They've got more aggression, in, you know? In a healthy society, men are absolutely free to inquire as to availability. And that's not an insult. Absolutely. And that's not harassment. Even no. if the woman didn't like it. She, as long as when she says no, the guy stops. Sure, exactly. Like, like, but the first, the first, hey, are you available? That is not stalking. And some women, no, they think that's stalking. And it's like, Get a therapist. Dude. Actually, we we have a big problem with polarity drop in the society. Yeah, so we do. we're we're creating a society where we're saying gender isn't real. We're saying that masculine and feminine. Are you saying gender is real? <laughs> yeah. What? Um, High I, five. Here's the thing. I have friends that are trans, and they're phenomenal people. And I'm all for people who want to change their gender. Go for it. Masculine and feminine are real, and men can have both, and women can have both. Exactly. Well, we have polarity within us, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we're forgetting is that we need polarity as life. You, you sound like David Data all of a sudden. Well, I'm not David Data by any means because David Data has his own issues, but I like his work. I really do like I, his, do I love his books. <laughs> yeah. But there's actually a couple, there's a couple in Austin that you should meet um, at their Alex and Annie, and they teach um, about sex secure, secure attachment. Oh, I'm, oh and I with sex? That's interesting. I'll, I love sign, these people because up. I saw that one of their talks and they gave a talk on how important it is for for people to maintain polarity in relationship. Yeah. And we need gender roles for polarity. We do. And when we flip those roles, polarity drops and the, the energy between two people drops. And one of the biggest problems for long-term relationships is people become less attracted to one another because they become they become habituated to each other and they stop playing the social roles that they were playing before when they were dating. Mm -hmm. Right? So like 
I know that I feel best when, I, when I'm with a man and I can drop into my feminine. Yeah. But when I need to go, and it's, it's funny because sometimes I need to be in CEO yeah, Molly. You have a pretty big masculine when you want I to. I certainly do. Yeah, but I'm also realizing yeah. that that masculine charge isn't always serving it, me. It costs you if you do too much of it. It's You're cost right. me too much cortisol. Yeah. It's cost me like having to, you know, deal with, I mean, it's cost me a lot in realizing that like I do need to drop, my, my feminine is power. And I don't, we're not taught that as women in modern it, society. It's a different kind of power than masculine power It's a too. different kind of power yeah. and it's it's very special. And like, I've had some great people who I've interacted in business who say, Molly, like when you're in your full feminine, like you're even more powerful. I want to listen to you more. Exactly. You know, and, and that that is not taught to us. Like we're, we're told as women in modern society that we need to be strong, we need to be powerful. We need like to lean men. in. Yeah, you know, like men, and that's not how and that's not how female power works. It's not, and, and in fact, what I think we need to move to, move into is we need to actually return to not not saying that I need to go into the kitchen and only cook and like build a family that, that that's way. That's not female that's power. That's definitely not what I'm saying. And there's a lot of people out there like Carnivore Aurelius, who's a guy on Instagram. That guy's hilarious. He's great, but he 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 and a lot of people are like like you know Andrew Tate. They're like women belong in the kitchen. Women don't we shouldn't be seen and not heard. But I also think that at least for me and my own experience is like what I'm aiming to cultivate next year is more of my feminine polarity because I got the masculine down. Good. Like it works. It, that's such you know? a that's such a magical path. And you mentioned some of this in the yeah. Spark Factor, which is which is very leading edge for the world of biohacking. Yeah. In this year, I'm bringing more of the sex polarity into the world of biohacking. Yeah. I have a roadmap for what I'm introducing Amazing. into like, well, let's be curious about this. Let's get the data. Let's do yeah. it. And you know, the, that third F word is the, it's the most charged. Yep. It's the hardest one to write about, but I'm bringing I mean, in experts. I'm writing about it. The biggest challenge we have yeah. right now is, is sex in society. I mean, it I is causing so much havoc. And the Me Too movement has been a movement around shame and blame of men who have honestly, a lot of cases not known that they were doing something wrong. And that's because the space between between emotional intimacy and physical intimacy is a black box gray area that it, like people are confused about that space. So I'm working on a sex therapy and we're going to create language for this space and we're going to create an entire protocol for this. You have to come back on and talk about that. Yeah, because it's exciting. I, I believe it's wrong to blame anyone for the color of their skin or for what's between their legs, even if it's a penis. Yeah. And like, I, well, that's where just is the, how the world is, works. Where, where, where are people getting educated about sex, right? I was educated about sex through pornography. That's where I learned about it. <laughs> Honestly, so what we're doing for our sex therapy we're building is we're going to build and it's, you know how OMG Yes was able to build like actual sexual demonstrations? Like mm -hmm. we're going to build those and we're going to teach people like this is modern sex, 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 sex education. Oh, yeah. But it's from the perspective, I was like, I, I, have a, I started as a psychedelic company, but it's morphed into a drug agnostic path because there's a lot of different medicines that can work to help enhance sexual function. Well, you could take uh, like oxytocin and, oxytocin and APO. PT-141. Oh, yeah. Even Viagra works for people, and like, and and yet there's also things coming. Like there's certain versions of um, psilocybin that are profoundly arousing and Do that I are not I'm... hallucinogenic. They don't make you trip hard, but they get you into your body, and they're beautiful, oh and God. they have no come down. I would kind of like to try that. Yeah, and so we're gonna. So I've got a team of people that I'm working with, collaborating with on the West Coast, um, that are building GMP certified lab that's creating extracts that are basically going to help people with sexual function. And then, I mean, obviously MDMA is on its path to getting approved. Yeah. MDMA healed my sexuality accidentally. I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. Before I got a medical license, I was experimenting with MDMA with a partner, and I went from having three different sexual dysfunctions to having zero. And it wow. came from, I didn't realize I had trauma. No one who has trauma knows they have trauma. That's the thing. It's like, invisible by definition. We don't know we have it until the thing, like I didn't know I had it until the symptoms of it had, had, had evaporated. And I was like, wait, so medicine in the context of a sexual experience that was very safe, took a memory that was unsafe and programmed it as safe. I was it, able to take an implicit memory and put it into explicit memory. Do you know how that works? I, I, I think I know how that works. Yeah. Okay. So this is at the core of what 40 Years is in, my neuroscience company yeah. does. You take an experience that's profoundly negative, yeah. the sensation of this experience, right? And yeah. you might feel that during- and the memory. Yeah, you might feel that during sex. Well, not, not the visualization, but it's how you felt during the memory, sure. not, not like the, the way it looked, but yeah. like the, the visceral it's feeling. It's more like you, when you're in that experience that resembles the original triggering experience, the, the original yeah. trauma, you get triggered. Yeah, so it's when you get triggered- And your body goes into either hyperarousal or shutdown. There you go. 
And at 40 Years of Zen, we use neurofeedback to teach you an exalted state that cancels it out. There's another way to do it, which is called orgasm. And some of like the kinkiest sex practices are actually people reaching cathartic healing Yeah. as a, as a part of well, that. Well, this is the thing. I've been talking to a lot of people in the BDSM community. And I have to say, like out loud, like I, for a period of time early in my uh, 30s, use BDSM as a healing technology. Tons and of people it, do that. Tra and I don't actually crave it anymore. But it, it's interesting because it played a role. I didn't, until I, it wasn't until I was studying sex actively and studying love and building a protocol that I was like, oh my God, like BDSM played a role in my healing. Who knew? And it was interesting because when you take experiences that you didn't have control over, mm -hmm. and then you now have an experience where you, you are creating the entire scenario, you're creating the entire context, you're, you're creating safety, you're creating trust, and you're going into that trance then you can like something flips in your brain and you're just like wow like i'm no longer afraid of this mm -hmm. and you know it, it was I, I didn't like over it, i did think the mdma did make a big difference in the arousal and the pain and the and the orgasm but it was it was definitely a journey i went on in the last 10 years of healing and i think healing is it's not like i'm not trying to sell people like you're going to be fixed overnight by this no, protocol it's it's, 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 a, work. it's about learning yeah. the practices of healthy sexuality and honestly, a lot of sex therapy that exists is basically sensate therapy, which is 50 years old, mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy, which focuses on the mind, and mindfulness-based therapy, which is all about mindfulness, which is great, but like, where's the sex therapy that focuses on pleasure? It's like, if the mindfulness you're talking about is the mind down here, that's different, but that's actually where a lot of the healing comes well, from. Well, our mind is it's, embodied in our body. Yeah. Mind is not separate. Um, to me, I believe Dan Siegel's definition of mind is energy and information flow, yeah. right? I love, I love his stuff, because he's like, Look, the mind is a product of physics. And if you study the physics of the body, you can understand how the mind can be dysregulated through metabolism, dysfunction, and trauma. This is why I always do a sex panel at the biohacking conference. I've yeah. had a dominatrix on a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, and sex therapists and energy workers with sex. And it's like one of the branches of biohacking. Yeah. But if you try to ignore that and say, well, you know, I stopped eating cornflakes and I started eating whatever butter and protein and coffee yeah. or whatever, it, that's not going to get you to that point where yeah. you're in this state of flow a lot of the yeah. time. You have to address this, yeah. uh, depending on your age, depending on all sorts of stuff. Some people don't have much trauma, but even then there's the whole world of this is like what's average and this is what's possible. And yeah. I'm looking to highlight for people, these are the things that are possible yeah. if that's what you are interested in. Yeah. And maybe you just want to be ripped and you don't care about your life in the bedroom very much, so you put your energy into the physical. Yeah. But for the spiritual side of sex, mm -hmm. which is what we're talking about here, it's the healing and trauma and spiritual side, it's different for men and women too. And yeah. you do go into some of this. I did try to touch on it a little bit, but, but I didn't want to write a, a book fully on it because that's what the next it, book's going to be. It would be a whole book, right? Yeah. I think like a lot of people are kind of functioning on a level of sexuality where it's just about friction. It's just about like in and out, in and out, and you're done. And that is just not great for most women, to be honest with you. I was just, this, <laughs> last night, I was listening to one of Osho's books on Tantra. Oh, or yeah. Or like so, something translated yeah. uh, or like written down yeah. from what he was talking about. And it's you almost quoted the book. Yeah. And, and it's like coupling is different than coupling with a lot of friction, even if there's lube. Yeah. Right? And so there's magical, exalted places. 20% of people report that they meet God during sex i see god every time yeah. i have sex and it's kind of it's kind of like one of those things where it's like you can't really have casual sex if you see god every time because you're like the person next to you is like what just happened <laughs> like what was that you have to you have to warn your partner you know you'd be like look uh so this thing's gonna happen and you know like but the thing is is that what i'm learning from, i have some great sex therapists that i work with they're mm -hmm. helping me design this protocol and you know they're like the, the reality is is that like Sex has a lot, there's this quote, right? Everything in life is about sex except for sex. Sex is about power. <laughs> and the, the reality is, is that when you start tapping into these powerful states, you do feel like you're a god, right? You feel like, okay, I am now, I'm on a whole other level, but you have to check yourself. You have to check your ego. And like, one of the things that's really come clear to me in my own life is like, there's this goddess in Hinduism called China Mastra, I believe her name is, mm -hmm. and I can't pronounce her, but she's this super badass goddess who like cuts her head off to feed her maidens and she's standing on these two people having sex. It's the weirdest scene you've ever seen. She's fierce. But what I what came up for me in a recent, um, you know, like hang, I was hanging out in the jungle with some friends in Puerto Rico and what came up for me was like, 
for me to take this sexual power that I have and to use it for good, I have to check my ego and I absolutely have to check my desire, right? Like you, when you mm-hmm. have this very energy tantric, flowing right. through your body, you, you, you realize that it's, it's, it's very powerful, but if you don't harness it, then it can take over. It can lead you into relationships that you shouldn't be in. Oh, yeah. It can make you do things you shouldn't do, you know? I, I've been working on, on teaching my kids that like, desire is natural, but it's not what you base a relationship on. The, and, and the beauty of, of, of desire is that what we're, what we're losing in our society is we're, we're so biased towards action that men and women are seeking immediate gratification through pornography, masturbation, and sex. And oftentimes what's really sexy and, tr- and what really turns you on is that is, is waiting, is that charge, mm-hmm. is that not acting on things, is actually letting the arousal build, is actually relaxing into your arousal. And when I learned that, I was like, whoa, like this isn't something I need to actually act on it every time. Like I can use this as fuel, I can transmute this into energy, I can actually feed it into whatever I need to do in my life. Like that's what we need to be teaching young people. And yet instead, we're teaching people that you should collapse your sexuality or you should go out and have sex with everything you can find. But- this is why I think in, in 2014, I published a year's worth of my ejaculation and happiness data. Right? <laughs> I love this. And I'm like, there is an ejaculation hangover. And ever since then, I was trying to disprove the Taoist yeah. stuff. And I'm like, you know what? This is for men, not for women. The equations yeah. are different. But I'm like, uh, ejaculating every time I have sex is a stupid thing to do. Totally. It depletes men. Yeah. And so, but that means also you're ready for sex more often. You're happy to have sex, and it's not about getting to the end. Yeah. It's about having a good time, and yeah. it's just it's it's really been transformative for me to know that. Yeah. Because I have my energy way more often, and there's these people who who come out. There's no evidence for that. You know, men should ejaculate all the time, and I'm like, you're not a very conscious person because, or or you don't have a penis, so you just don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you just have to feel that. Yeah. But I, I mean, I tracks. I was so desperate to prove that ejaculation was good for me because I mean, hey, I would do it twice a day if it was you know going to make me live longer. It yeah. doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. I mean, that's definitely like Taoist practices for sure. Yeah. You know, and I mean, like there. And what I didn't realize is there's all sorts of like lineages that are, that are out there. So cool. Kama right? Mudra is like this lineage that this guy kind of like broke off of Buddhism and get kind of like like it's funny because like you read about these people and they all face controversy. Anybody who deals with sex, always you deal with controversy inevitably. And so, but it's but it is the frontier of biohacking, right? It's like mm-hmm. we got to we got to do it for because if we don't, then society is going to continue to devolve in this area. A hundred percent. My the mission that I have for my group of companies is to actually to upgrade humanity. Like yeah. I, we need some software and maybe even some hardware upgrades. And if yeah. we don't get those in place soon, we'll probably be a failed species. So, I know. Like, it, it's time. Yeah. And it's interesting that about a year ago, I consciously uncoupled. And what you're saying, because um, thankfully, you know, my former wife and I both have done enough of our work, we managed to do it without going into like the fighting awesome. and anger. And like, we're friends and we talk and we're co-parenting. And, like, it, it all wow. worked. It was, it was still not you know painless, yeah. but um, but now that I'm single, it, it's like okay, I can go to any of these classes, and I have been studying this stuff for many years. Yeah. You can tell by publishing stuff on Taoism ten years ago. Yeah, um, it, it's one of those things where biohacking had to reach a critical mass globally for this to be taken seriously. Yeah, and I think we're there. There's you know, tens of millions of self-identified biohackers. I just yeah. published a picture from downtown Austin, two of the different high rises. You look, and there's like at night, it's all just normal lights. And then, like, there's one place that's entirely red, and over there on another building, these are biohackers who are like, oh my God, when we have red lights at night, yeah. I can sleep. My house, everything's red. The neighbors think it's for Christmas. Like in July, oh, they're wow. going to figure out something else. Yeah. But I do that. Yeah. Because it's worth it. And that's just an indication there's enough of us that now we can be like, all right, let's use science around yeah. sex instead of shame and like Catholic guilt or something. Yeah. And, and do it in a way that's not icky, that's yeah. not porn, but it is going to be sticky if it's not icky because that's what's like sex is messy. It, it just yeah. is, right? Yeah. And so just to, to be humorous, mm-hmm. but to be curious and open and recognize the spiritual side of it, yeah. it it's one of the paths to enlightenment. Yeah. And, and it's not the only one. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've had experiences in the last year that were so profound that I was like, I didn't know my body could do that. Like, <laughs> right. I didn't know that that was even remotely possible. <laughs> and then you're like, what is next? You know, like, how is this like, how, like, it's just profound. And it's, and it is a path for spirituality yeah. and it can change your life. But it also, I think with, with great power is great responsibility, right? Like the more you build this power within you, the more you're responsible for it. Well, I didn't think we were going to talk about all this cool stuff, Mel. You're always full of the latest <laughs> biohacking goodness. Cool. Yeah. 
I want people to recognize the work that you put into your book. Um, you know, you are trained in medicine. Yeah. And you're not just trained in medicine. You just talked a lot about uh, Tantra. Sure. <laughs> and you talk a lot about psychedelics and trauma yeah. healing. Yeah. So I would say you're a well-rounded biohacker. For and sure. And you focused on specifically women for the spark factor. And I Although I say w men could read this book too, oh, specifically yeah. because so many men are so confused about their partners. And they're just like, how does my like why why is she a different person every part of oh, the month? You oh my know? god! In fact, one of the the laws in Game Changers, my big personal development book, I don't know if yeah. that's one that you read or not, yeah. um, is specifically around what you write about in the Spark Factor. Yeah. And men, if you don't know when day twenty two is, then you're fucked. <laughs> okay, it, so it, true. Am I right? <laughs> so true. <laughs> okay. I mean, your luteal phase is a, is a challenging period because you're just basically like. Your progesterone is your estrogen's low, and your progesterone is all you know all over the place. And, and if you, it depends on where you're at, your stress levels. But basically, you just feel like crap, and you're just like, I don't want to deal with anyone right now. And nothing that your man does can be right that day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and you can be like, show up with flowers and chocolate, like that wasn't the right chocolate, and I'm allergic to those flowers. And, yeah. and it's like, for God's sake! But if you know this as a guy, you're like, yeah, it's okay, babe. You know, right. and, and and you just let it go. That's the thing, like, and, and I think there was this one actress who was pointing out that she had to train herself to behave differently during that, that phase, and she got so much flack for it, for just saying, like, look, I know myself, and I'm not always an easy person this time of the month. And there's a lot of women like me who are in their late 30s, early 40s, and your progesterone levels are shifting as you're, and, and like, I actually, I don't think enough people are measuring their hormones. A lot, not enough women, not enough women are looking at their hormones. When my cortisol was high, my estrogen was low, mm -hmm. and it was because my body was prioritizing threat over pr reproduction, and it was it was clearly I mean, it was clearly a response to heavy heavy stress. Mm -hmm. And once my stress levels improved, my cortisol re resolved, my estrogen levels re resolved, and everything got better. But it was definitely a period where I was like, okay, I can definitely see this firsthand. I need to chill out. Okay. I think we said a lot of things that were important or truthful. I think we're saying a lot of things that people want to say, but they're too afraid to say. Yeah, exactly. You know? And yeah. you know what that means? That means you're dangerous, because who knows what you might do. I've been told I'm dangerous. Well, you drank the <laughs> coffee. You must be dangerous, right? Yeah. And, and I think we can wrap the show up and, and say, I hope that you are dangerous as well, uh, because there's two kinds of peaceful people in the world. Yeah. There's people who are beaten down and weak and tired and malnourished and yeah. don't have any love or community. Yeah. And you're peaceful because you don't have any choice about it. Yeah. That's kind of a dark future. The other kind of peaceful is that you are so eminently powerful that you can choose to be kind and peaceful. Yes. And you can handle anything that comes your way. Yes. And that's the world that we're both working on building. Exactly. And, and that's what people learn about, especially women and the men who love them. The Spark Factor is the name of the book. Is there a URL, Molly, for this? Just go to drmolly.co. It's on the homepage. All right. Well, drmolly.co. We can all remember that. Um, you're doing good work in Thank medicine you. and biohacking Thank in the you. world. And Thanks. you're, even with a medical license, you're talking about the hard stuff yeah. like orgasm and sex and relationships and all. And kudos because Thanks. that actually takes courage and integrity. And Thank you're just, you. you're doing good work. I've known you for a few years now and just watching your focus and keep it up. Appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Molly. All right, that was great. Thank you oh, for having so me. Oh, you're so welcome. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. The Human Upgrade.